I, I messaged Molly to see if she wants to join by phone. If if she does, we're going to have to use the conference line, which is not set up currently, but we can. Do we want to just wait for a few minutes to see? Well, let's go ahead and get started, and then if we have to change it up, we will. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, exciting day. It is um, our first regular meeting of the Cook County Board of Commissioners here this morning. On Tuesday, January 11th, I'd like to call the meeting to order. And if everyone would stand, uh, we'll go ahead with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So as we get started, I'd like to note that we have a couple of people that aren't uh, with us and are joining us by phone. Um, Brady Powers is going to be joining us by phone. He's actually on the line at this point, and we're trying to reach um, Attorney Hicken and find out if she will be joining us as well. Um, we are together in person today. We do not have an emergency order, so by statute we need to meet in person. I just wanted to clarify that. And I wanted to make one other comment before we begin. One of our former commissioners, Frank Moe, as we know, has been struggling with brain cancer and has gone into hospice. And just on behalf of Cook County and not only our organization, but all of the people here in our county, I'd like to wish him the best as he goes through this time and wish Sherry as well the best. With that, um, are there any adjustments to our agenda today? Any adjustments to the agenda? With that, is there a motion to approve the agenda? Motion to approve the agenda. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Swallison. Is there a second? Sorley support. Thank you, Commissioner Storley. We have a motion and support. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right. Uh, this is time for our public comment. Mm -hmm. And um, just to be aware of the guidelines for our public comment is to um, come forward to the microphone that you see on your left to address the county board in any manner of county concern. And when invited to speak, please speak into the microphone for clarity, sign in, and state your name and address. And we'd like to keep public comments to about five minutes, if you could. All right, any public comments today? Thank you. Sign in where? Um, <clears throat> there should be a pen there for you. Thank you. And just name and address is all we need. Thank you. I'm actually just writing my name, Graham Ray and District 4. But anyway, um, you can look it up if you want. <laughs> um, anyway, my name's Steve Watson. I'm going to, happy birthday, by the way. Um, heard it on WTIP. Anyway, I came, I came to talk about the, um, this, the um, decision to um, um, mandate vaccinations for the people from Cook County. And I just wanted to, and then, or, or testing. And I just wanted to um, talk about that a little bit and just voice. Um, so um, the, the, the deal is, is if you want to get vaccinated, I think that's fine. It really isn't a vaccination. It's a flu shot because it doesn't provide immunity. And the proof is that um, your governor was what got his second uh, his booster in October and had COVID in December and I know two people in Cook County right now quarantining that have had two shots and a booster and have COVID um, right now so that the assumption that um, and there aren't that many things here the assumption that you're only going to have to test the unvaccinated is uh, is an assumption that's false it's proven you can look at the M NFL it's all over everywhere just think with your brain 
And so if you're going to mandate testing, you need to test everybody because your vaccine doesn't provide immunity. If, if you were immune, like when you got mumps, you, you wouldn't need to test them. But it doesn't provide immunity, and it's proven it's all over. All you do is have to open your eyes and think with your brain. So, so making that assumption, the second thing I want to say is that if, it, if it's so effective that, you, that it can affect a whole room of people, you don't have to stick a five-inch stick up somebody's nose. You can get it in the first inch of their nose. You don't, that's cruelty, and I think actually just thinking about it, that's to force people who decide not to, to go get vaccinated because that's mean. It hurts, and, and it's a wrong thing to do to people. Uh, so anyway, and, and um, you're, if you mandate something, this is an experimental drug. Do you know, I, I have Pfizer information. This is not, uh, Pfizer's own information, 1,200 deaths, bunch of abortions, whole bunch of other things just from Pfizer vaccine of their own data, and you're going to mandate that to people in Cook County? If you, I, the, okay, I'm going to go back before I talk about that. The first time I was driving and, and I hear that um, we have to protect the people of Cook County, I never, not once, and I've lived here since the 80s, early 80s, 1980, um, I never have, Went, thought that the com county commissioners were responsible to protect me, except with law enforcement and with standing and plowing new roads. And, and now that I drive a lot, I've had some harrowing experiences on some bad ice, you know, that, are, that I'd rather get protected from that. You can't. Biden just last week said the federal government can't can't do anything to support this. So why would you think Cook County could? They have trillions. You have a few million. Um, they couldn't. They can't do it. Um, all this information. It, it's like so. My my big thing is right now. Your tr division is the problem. The people of Cook County are wonderful. They work together. I've thought. You know what? If there's ever something major happen. When Harley was fishing, I mean, and there was shortage of food, guess what? I think you could get fish. They'd just drop their nets, go down there and get it. People would work together and, 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 and help each other here. And that's a good thing for Cook County. But division, dividing, the country's trying to divide over patriotism or conservatism <coughs> or Christian, and now it's dividing over vaccine, and they're using junior high peer pressure tactics to do it. That's how Hitler got in. He blamed the Jews, and look what happened. You're running the very same playbook that that happened. Solomon in the Bible, in Ecclesiastes, says everything's a wheel in a wheel, where the wheel has come around. Okay, we have to, if we do the same thing, we'll get the same result. Look what's happening in Australia. Look what's happening in Canada. They actually have concentration camps and they're gr grabbing these people and, and throwing them in it. What, what does that look like? That's why we learn history. We don't learn history to learn dates. We learn history to learn what happens when we do these things because they happen again. That's why, you know, what goes around comes around. That's from the Bible. That's why that statement is. So anyway, um, I'm, I'm very concerned. I actually believe, so the, because these things are um, experimental, nobody can sue all these people that these vaccines have hurt. And actually, one person has died from, from Cook County, right? But I know two people with major heart things that from the vaccine and and Tina George just died from blood clots I think and that's a side effect of vaccination now I was going to call her call Dave but I didn't get home till too late last night and I didn't have time this morning okay to make sure but those are side effects that's three there's probably more if you start looking into 
Um, strokes, stroke is a side effect. Look into heart attacks. If you have blood clots and those things happen, you're, you're but they're all hidden. It's not being report. It's not. It's hidden. It's not being blamed on that. Or people could, people would make different choices. Vaccinating kids. They have a what one in a million chance or something of dying. Not hardly any have died. And um, and you're going to vaccinate them. You wouldn't vaccinate that. Why would you? It, it doesn't even make sense um, to do that. They have a better chance of dying going to school on the school bus than that. Um, you, you, you just, uh, so anyway, those are my concerns. Actually, since the government, oh, the last thing I want to say is in 2015, there was um, started a negotiation between Moderna and the United States of America, one of our offices. It actually was signed, I think, in 2018, and the, our government owns half of the Moderna vaccination before. COVID ever came out. Um, I can bring you documentation if you want it. But anyway, um, so to, for the government, to, that would, that's a conflict of interest. They, sh they shouldn't be involved at all, and they sure shouldn't be mandating. But anyway, because it's experimental, nobody can sue. These companies are never going to go regular because they'll lose everything and they're making billions. They will lose everything. Those 1,200 from Pfizer would take all their money in lawsuits. They'd be bankrupt. So I guess my, my thing is, is if you mandate it, I think because you're the one signing it, it's a free choice. I'm not against getting vaccinated or, and, and I don't <laughs> care if you do or you don't. What I'm, what I'm against is mandating it. <coughs> and, and personally, I think you need to be all responsible, your house, your fortune, if you do it. You, if you really want to protect the people of Cook County, you back it up with your money. Not the county, you, you guys. Thank you very much, Mr. Thanks. Watson. We appreciate your words today. Thanks. Have a good day. Thank you. Are there any other public comments today? Any other public comments? Anybody on the line? Nobody on the line, and I have not received any written comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Yorkey. All right, at this point, we will move on to our consent agenda items. We have a number of items there today. Are there any items that someone would like to pull? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Mills would like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Mills. Is there a second? Hawkins support. Thank you very much, <coughs> Commissioner Hawkins. So we have a motion and support. Any further discussion? <coughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right, at this point, we'll move on in our agenda to item number four which is human resources. And we're excited to have with us this morning, Leah Ekstrom. Well, good morning. Good morning, Leah. <laughs> Just wanted to give a little informational update as we've had a number of job openings, new hires, and resignations over the past know, number of months. So let's just say six. So, yeah, we're making headway. Um, it seems to be taking up, as it should, um, a lot of time in human resources. But we've had a lot of good progress, I think, in the last um, definitely couple of weeks. Um, social services, just to start there with public health and human services. Um, there were three job openings and they're still available. We're making progress in two with the eligibility specialist and adult services. We had interviews last week and are moving forward to hiring in both of those positions. So 
nothing official yet, but going that direction. And then this week with adult um, in-home support, we're doing that closed on Friday and we're doing interviews there. We've been working with their merit system um, to really get some good applicants. So hopefully they'll be, I don't wanna say it too much, but fully staffed soon and, and making progress in that direction. Um, another one we're working on is the veteran service officer. We have interviews this week um, and then hopefully moving forward in that as well as um, the radio analyst um, position in MIS. So had some applicants there. Another one we're working towards is payroll. We've had or interviews the last couple of weeks. And so hopefully um, after talking with Brady Powers later today, we might be moving forward in that. So where else? Um, the sheriff's office, they are finalizing some background checks with the deputy position. Um, and so waiting, I know that's kind of a longer process that they need to undertake for that. So, um, and then dispatch is the other one we're working on filling at this point in time. Uh, let's see, and then our public information coordinator. Um, we're working on interviewing with that with the <coughs> hospital. Um, so coordinating that, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Administrator yorkie has been working with the hospital to get that Correct. interview coordinated. So, yeah. So those are our openings and process right now. Um, yeah. And Madam Chair, <clears throat> if I could jump in, I just want to recognize the great work that Leah and our part-time human resources generalist Kathy Polly are doing. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, Leah started this position at the beginning of November and really kind of <laughs> jumped in feet first. Um, and there's so much going on. It's, it's a tremendously difficult time for employers across the country right now. Um, I think we've all heard of the challenges that organizations are facing, uh, retaining and recruiting new staff. And uh, we're, we're no different from any other organization. And uh, Leah has really had her hands full, um, but she's just really, uh, gotten off to a running start and I just want to say I'm really grateful Leah for the work that you're doing to to help us move forward and to get good people uh, into the organization thank you thanks and we'll continue to work and reach out across the state where we can to try and fill these positions that are harder to fill um, and I know we're working on that right now especially with law enforcement I think that's a tricky mm -hmm. so working with the sheriff and his office to try and fill those positions well, Leah, we appreciate all you do, and yeah. um, we know that our employees have really worked hard because of the shortages. They've covered <coughs> for other people. Mm -hmm. They've really dug in, and they're just kind of hanging on by a thread, and we want to recognize and let them know that we appreciate all of them for the hard work that they've done during this really difficult time. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I know as commissioners, we sometimes ask employees to get information or research or things for us, and we're going to try to be very mindful not to add to their workload. <laughs> and if we have things that we need, information that we need, we'll go through Administrator Yorkie to get that and make sure that he works with department heads so that we're not putting any greater burden on our employees than mm -hmm. they are. They're just doing a fabulous job. Yeah, it's, yeah. People have been asked a lot in the last number of months. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Appreciate that. Otherwise, yeah, we're just moving forward all the, in other aspects as well. Um, there's the uh, pay equity report, which is due the end of January. So that'll be coming before you in the next couple of weeks to approve that report. So, um, and then working with our new benefits, with our new insurance. So getting that out to employees so that they're updated and utilizing what they can that we have. So, yeah, any other? Any other questions, mm, comments? For me? Commissioner Mills. M Madam Chair, I don't, I don't have any comments, but I, I just want to say um, your report is some of the best news I've heard in quite some time. There's been <laughs> um, job openings for a very long time, uh, mm -hmm. many job openings. So <clears throat> to hear that there's interviews um, going is just very encouraging uh, because mm -hmm. that has not been the case for a number of positions for quite some time. Um, and then just having you in, in your role now, taking on as much as you did, just right out of the gate, I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your hard work. Yeah. All right. Well, thank mm -hmm. you so much. Right. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. You too. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. All right. We're going to continue on with our agenda. And I... Um,
see that Elena Hansel is here. We have um, some information and updates from Soil and Water. I don't have my PowerPoint because I don't know how to work that, so I just have it printed out. <laughs> I may share. Mm -hmm. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, should I just go ahead and get started here? Okay. Um, so they have a few motions before you as you're aware in that county water planner and so I'll go over the presentation in a minute but Cook County as we transition from the local water management plan we're transitioning into the rain over headwaters so we'll have these two watershed plans the history of water management planning within the counties is always that there's been a citizen advisory group and so um, with the transition into these watershed plans we don't really need that group anymore because we won't have a locally this small tiny little county plan instead we have these larger watershed plans we still will have citizens engaged they can still come to meetings they can participate it's just we don't need this advisory committee to inform a plan we don't have anymore so the fo first motion I have before you which I'd ask you to approve is to disband this water um, plan advisory committee they are disappointed because it's a really fun group of people <laughs> and we meet a couple of times a year and you know they really have been um just phenomenal to work with so i think all the people i've been here for since 2011 that i've gotten to work with it's just been amazing and hopefully we'll be able to use um the individuals in different capacities and with conservation so that's the first motion i have before you all right any questions for elena is there a motion <coughs> Madam Chair, I'd make the motion to disband the Cook County Local Water Plan Advisory Committee. Thank you, Commissioner Mills. Is there a second? Swallison second. Thank you, Commissioner <coughs> Swallison. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. Um, the second one I have now before you is I'm just going to give you a quick brief update as to why I'm here and asking for approval for this work plan. As you know, we've adopted the county and the Soil and Water Conservation District have adopted the One Watershed, One Plan for Lake Superior North, and that was adopted in 2017. With that adoption, every biennium, there is funding that comes forward. So, and there's a policy committee. And that policy committee consists of a supervisor from each Soil and Water Conservation District as their elected officials, and then um, a commissioner from each of the two counties, so from Lake and Cook County. They make up the policy committee. They help direct how that funding is going to be spent because it impacts both the county and the Soil and Water Conservation District. It's been asked to have approval through each of the boards for how the money is spent each biennium. So just a brief reminder, um, where is the Lake Superior North watershed and how does it go? If you turn to the next page, um, it's that whole blue area. So it goes all the way to Grand Portage and they're welcome to participate however they would like. Um, all the way down to Lake County, you'll see a little bit is in St. Louis County, but they opted not to participate in the plan because they had less than 10%, I believe it's 10 or 25% within the watershed. And so the, um, they just signed a little memo saying we're not doing it and they don't get any funding <laughs> and it just goes all to Lake and Cook County and to the organizations involved. The next page shows um, what do we use this watershed based implementation funding for. The funding is provided through the, border, the Board of Water and Soil Resources. It's provided to partners who have adopted the One Watershed One Plan. But partners outside of those who have adopted it are welcome to use the money as long as they're working with the Soil and Water Conservation District or the county. And I'll give an example of that in a minute. And then funding is to be used to implement the activities in the plan for the benefit of soil and water. So you can't just come and say, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and piecemeal it. We've developed a process which we're always fine tuning to ensure that it's related to the plan, ensure that it's um, going to have measurable outcomes and be used because this is citizens money and we want to do conservation. The next page kind of gives you a bit more history. So in the fiscal year 2018, the watershed was awarded $387,59,000. Projects that were included, and this is a picture of it, but it's the Grand Marais Stormwater Projects. This was our first year of funding, so we got to figure out how we we're going to use it. 
And they, um, we worked with the city to install a giant sediment basin at the East 2nd Avenue. And so you can check it out if you ever have the opportunity, but this is what it looks like during construction. This year, we're gonna be finishing up the uh, 8th Avenue. Um, you know, there's a big sediment basin by where the old pool is. We're gonna be fixing that and doing downstream work so that it actually functions and does what it's supposed to be doing. And then um, our office did an assessment of Village Ditch, Nature Boy Creek, whatever you would like to call it, <laughs> looking for sediment. Um, it's been really ch altered and changed, so we um, were able to get designs completed so we now can secure more funding to fix that. We've had a lot of landowners in that area call us. And then we're continually working with the city of Grand Marais and with the residents for stormwater issues. So that's how that funding is being utilized. It expires at the end of this year. Then there's also the Lake Superior Coastal Erosion Mapping Tool, which I have training on. Um, I have the training, and if anybody's interested, we have it for landowners, for business owners, to be able to understand erosion rates and um, when they're doing development, to be able to use this tool to um, help them understand things. And then this tool has got four phases. We're just now um, into phase four, and that is gonna help completely determine erosion rates. So land services will be able to, for example, pull this up and say, oh, this area you wanna build in has an erosion rate of X, Y, and Z. You actually probably should build it back farther. So it's a huge process. It normally takes four to five years. So that was phase one, it was done with this um, funding. Questions so far? <laughs> Madam Chair. Um, thank you. Um, Elena, as far as um, the Village Ditch Nature Boy Creek Assessment and Project yeah. Design, can you talk a little bit about the scope of that? Yeah, so um, technician Phil Larson in our office worked with our engineers that we contract out, and they walked the whole thing and did what's called a banks model. So they looked at the uh, banks for, I don't know how to describe it, but they looked at the creek and what they did was determine where's the largest sediment coming from, and then they created designs um, to fix it, basically. And so I haven't had a chance to review it yet, but I know that there's one area just um, south of the business park. And so we are in close okay. contact with the engineer working with the EDA, who's doing the stormwater management plans for the business park. So that means um, as we move forward, we can really connect with him and ensure that all of this is working together instead of two separate systems. But yeah, so it was just um, an opportunity to be able to understand that system better. And then when landowners call us too, we can pull it up and say, oh yeah, this bank is really eroding. That's probably because it's getting this much more water. So it's looking at that whole watershed. Thank you. Um, the reason I ask is um, when the new Gunflint Trail was put yes. in, um, there were culverts put in to um, help manage some of the water north of that road. Yes. Um, and um, there were some natural pathways for the water before that. And so some of the culverts I've noticed did not line up and have caused some issues with some of that. Um, some of that property. I'm not sure that it's county property, but it is school property at least. Um, and of course there's um, uh, unofficial trail there as well. Mm -hmm. And so that trail has been impacted. And so I didn't know if it was possible to include kind of that up to the road um, area as an assessment, part of the assessment too. I can look into that and okay. see where we're at and get back to you for sure. Okay. Well, yeah, I don't need an answer, I guess. I okay. But just yeah, a we, heads up if, if that's possible if that's yeah for sure practical or you know yep. appropriate <laughs> yeah thank you um yeah thank you so the next is fiscal year 2020 this one you'll see it's broken in by counties and swcds because of the nature i'm going to back up in fy 2018 the soil and water conservation district was a fiscal agent as we moved into fiscal year 2020, the counties came forward and said, hey, we wanna actually do some projects with this money. We wanna do a lot with septic systems. Well, soil and waters don't, we don't do septic systems. And I said, <laughs> I, I just, I didn't want to be responsible for that. Um, and we just didn't wanna have that obligation. So the state was kind enough to give us two separate contracts for this watershed funding, which is why it's split up as it is um, for that amount. So the soil and water conservations, this is still an active grant. Um, work that is and or has been completed is the City of Two Harbors completed their stormwater management plan with this funding. They have installed a stormwater dissipator. Um, it's something that we can look at for the City of Graham Wright's pretty cool contraption. Uh, again, we're working continually on that coastal erosion project. So we're on phase two and phase three started to get finished, which is just collecting more and more data and forming the process. 
We have education outreach planned for landowners within the watershed. Some of this may be in Lake County, not in Cook. Forestry work and then urban green infrastructure and that would be taking place in two harbors. And then the counties, um, they, you know, way to go land services, they um, did over around 100 septic systems were brought into compliance in Cook County during this time. And so that was been the last two years. And then um, in case you didn't know, they were featured in the Board of Law and Soil Resources snapshots. So that's just a highlight of their article. And then Lake County is also working on the septic system work for this funding. Questions on that? Yeah. <laughs> What's, yeah, thank you. What's urban green infrastructure? Yeah, so that's just simply like these giant dissipators or it's rain gardens or it's just, um, it's not the traditional of like rain gutter, stormwater system, blah, 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 blah. It's actually treating the water before it goes somewhere, trying to store it, slow it down, just different um, systems depending on what the landscape and what the water needs, the quantity, so. Thank you. Yeah. So then the last page, that brings us up to right now, which is fiscal year 2022. We have the same amount for the watershed um, as in 2020, which is exciting. Um, we have additional partners that are gonna work with the counties and the soil and water, water conservation districts. So ARDC, um, and this is our current work plan, which I'm gonna be asking you to approve. ARDC is gonna be finishing up that Lake Superior erosion mapping tool. They also have a grant with the coastal program. So it's, it's being partially funded through other mechanisms. Um, we would like to continue as a conservation district to do coastal erosion and education outreach. We did um, an effort this summer and reached well over 150 people. So we wanna continue that in a couple years and try to hit the next group of people as, as people continue to shift through. The Skunk Creek has stream bank stabilization. So that's, um, Lake SWCD. The city of Silver Bay is gonna be a stormwater management plan. So they've put in for an application. We'd like to award that. We're really excited because we've been working, um, well, Lake SWCD has been working with them for three, sorry, since 2018 to try to get this forward. So we're excited that they're on board now and, and wanting to do that. Um, the city of Grand Marais, we're gonna be, and Cook County Highway Department and the Soil and Water, we're gonna be looking at, again, green infrastructure. So with the improvement of Fifth Avenue, what can we do to slow that water down? Because we've all seen that river going down that road and straight, just straight down. So what can we do to help um, with that? So this provides funding to be able to hire and um, get some new innovative things in there, hopefully. The city of Grand Marais, again, that village ditch, Nature Boy Creek, we're, for both of these, we'll, soil and water conservation will seek extra funding because it won't cover the cost, but it gives us a place to have that leveraged funds to provide match for other funding. So this will be one project, um, Nature Boy Creek, and then hopefully doing some stormwater um, ponds north of the Gunflint Trail. And then update um, the Lake Superior North One Watershed Plan, which I will be coming to you again because we have to update the plan every five years. So we'll look at our accomplishments over the five years and um, update the plan as necessary. We, um, Lake County has put in to do a GIS inventory of delineated wetlands, so get it more down at the local level um, so they can see it more um, at a parcel level instead of so general. <coughs> and then inventory of shoreline restoration projects, and that's again Lake County, so they, want, they would like to evaluate some of the success and failures of the Lake Superior properties that have had either vegetation or hard armoring done, and is it working, should they continue with their process. So this is um, the work plan for our fiscal year 2022. The Cook County Soil and Water Conservation District at our last board meeting approved for us to be the fiscal agent. So I will be managing this process again. I'm, it's my third time with it, so I get it. <laughs> um, and I understand how the process works and I work closely with the state on this. So what I'm asking is that the um, commissioners that you approve our work plan and then we can continue to move forward. And if there's questions, again, please ask them. It's a lot of information to cover. Commissioner Mills. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Elena, this is uh, an amazing list, very ambitious. Thank you so much for, for your willingness to, to work on the plan and put this together. Um, it can really, really help our communities out um, drastically. And, um, and it's just really, really exciting. So thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Any other comments or questions for Elena? All right, if not, I'd entertain a motion. 
Madam Chair, I'd like to make the motion um, to approve the fiscal year 2022 watershed based uh, implementation funding and plan. Thank you, Commissioner Mills. Is there support? Storley support. Thank you, Commissioner Storley. Any further <coughs> discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right, thank you very much. Um, to continue on then, as the water planner, I also do all the reporting for the county for what's called the Natural Resource Block Grant. So um, I'll be coming again before you because we have to close out all those grants for fiscal year 2021. But um, for now, I have these two. So the county has been awarded for a number of years uh, upgrade funding to upgrade septic systems for folks um, with a lower income. And it provides around $10,000 for each system, and it's pretty beneficial. And then often the landowners will combine that with a septic system loan through the county. So um, we're at that time of year where we just start closing things out. And so I would like a motion, if possible, to close out the fiscal year 2018 SSTS upgrade um, funding. All that funding was spent to upgrade systems. All right. Madam Chair, Wells. I need to recuse myself from this item. I understand. Thank you. Commissioner Spallis. I will make the motion to close out the Cook County Physical Year 2018 Septic Treatment System Upgrade. Thank you, Commissioner Spallis. Is there support? Storley support. Thank you, Commissioner Storley. Any further discussion? And Madam Chair, I cannot discuss this item uh, because I recuse myself, but uh, I've been advised by Attorney Hicken in the past that if someone's going to recuse themselves, you should explain why, and it's because I have uh, received funding through this program in the past. So. Thank you for explaining that, Commissioner Mills. I appreciate that. Any further discussion or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. So as we close this one out, we also need to work on 2019, and there's a whole more bunch more, but um, these two are connected because 2019 provided funding um, for a system, but it expires in 2021. It just expired. So. Um, we do need, ret need to return funding up to the amount of the $25,350. It's hard to find landowners um, willing to come forward to use this. Even we try, I know the county tries to promote it and let people know, but it's, I think, just hard for people. So sometimes we have to return the money. So um, when we get these grants, all the money comes to the county and then the county disperses it out. So it's not a reimbursement program like some grants. So because of that, the county then needs to return this funding that wasn't spent. We cannot get in. Um, an extension on it sometimes due to legislation language and grant funding it prohibits what you can and can't get extensions for so with that being said um, we were they were able to spend around five thousand dollars the county was of this funding originally that was provided so would like to return this remaining amount then all right Commissioner Storley thank you madam chair so we returned the money mm -hmm. but it's a new year so do you get more money now starting with the new year yeah so the county did receive funding and i have to apologize because i've been doing a lot of reporting in for 2020 and 2021 um the hard part is, is when you have to send money it's not that it's a mark on you but it's kind of a mark because what they see is oh you don't need the money so then yeah. they reduce the amount yeah. um that you get for like the next year so um I wouldn't be surprised if in 2022, if the county chooses to apply, the amount is reduced because we still have a lot of money and it's getting returned. Oh. So mm -hmm. unfortunately it kind of leaves that mark, but as it gets spent, then you can get more money, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. so. Well, the reason I ask is because we've updated over hundred septic systems, yeah. which is fabulous. <laughs> um, I don't know, is the word need to be out there more? Or I think, you know, with the, our rural area, I would think people, if they knew about it, would certainly want to at least apply. Yeah, and I, I'm not sure where the county is at because it's the county's program, so I just have been doing the reporting. Um, mm -hmm. I will tell you the guidelines for this is that you have to be um, a year-round resident. They try to not have seasonal as much as possible. For this funding, you, sorry, you can't be seasonal. You have to be a year-round resident. Mm -hmm. And you do have to meet specific income guidelines, which I know we increase. I, when I ran the program, I was increased every year. and based off of what people tell me, I try to get it so they could get in the program. Um, fitting still, again, legally within the parameters, but um, you have to, yeah, just meet very specific parameters. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the systems that were upgraded, if they were year-round or not, and what all those thresholds were, but it's definitely something the county could work you know, through mm -hmm. to step right. in it. We appreciate that feedback. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Spallison. Just 
to educate myself when we say we're going to return this money who is it going back to it goes back to the state so the border water and soil resources and the mpca collaborate on this so my understanding is it'll go some between one of those two i imagine the mpca and then they'll reallocate it to somebody else so it goes back into that coffer so. thank you yep um Madam Chair, sure and just for just for added perspective, um, I too had to fall within the, the income guidelines, and so um, it's a pretty narrow group of people in our county who are going to qualify for that. And it, I mean, basically, younger families um, is is I'd say a, a generalization, but I'm sure that's not entirely the case. At no, all. I know it's it seems to be not so much in the middle, like, <laughs> but it seems to be the lower. Or the folks on Social Security. Okay. Um, and okay, when right. I had a lot of those people just come in and be like, I'm on Social Security. Yep. And the nice thing is, is we had a few contractors. I don't, again, I'm removed from this program now, other than reporting that when the landowner would say, hey, I'm up working with this grant, the contractors would just really cut the cost as low as possible so that the landowners didn't have to um, take out much of a loan or anything. So sometimes they would just say, here we did it. You know, it was pretty amazing to watch some of that happen. It was the part I really liked about my job. So it was good to see. Good, well, good information for us to have, definitely. And I, th I think, again, just because uh, uh, we also ran into difficulties with uh, implementing and just timelines and supply issues and all that, so I can easily see how money would have to also get returned if it can't be spent in yep. a certain time. And we all know the contractors are uh, <laughs> stretched, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, just like everyone in, in our county is. So, um, But because of that, I think I also need to recuse myself of this one yes. um, just to, to clarify that. Um, timeline yeah, absolutely <laughs> absolutely thank you commissioner Swallison. i will make the motion to return cook county physical year 2019 septic treatment system upgrade and rbg in the amount of twenty five thousand three hundred and fifty dollars thank you is there support really mm -hmm. support thank you commissioner storley we have a motion and support any further discussion all in favor aye, aye. opposed Motion carries. All right. Thank you, and I'll be back for more. <laughs> Absolutely. <signing> off, so. <laughs> we <laughs> love having you. Thank you, Have Elena. A good day. Thank you. Have a good day. All right. On our agenda, we're going to move on to MIS, and I see Rowan Watkins coming forward. Good morning, Rowan. Good morning. Madam Chair, Commissioners, um, today we have a scheduled regularly scheduled replacement of pcs laptops and copiers and so this is part of our uh, budgeted regularly scheduled replacement for these items and we are um, seeking your approval for to move forward with that i would stand for any questions on, on this. commissioner storley madam chair thank you um is this for the whole county departments it is okay yep Okay, so everybody's included? Yes. As long as they need something? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so it, the way that it works is that um, for laptops, as an example, um, we try not to let any laptop get older than three years. Um, we have a total of 75 laptops, and um, we do, as this is a capital account, so it does roll over, but we do our best to replace a third of those every year. And so there may be some give or take, but that's the budget and the target and why we're seeking a, approval is to be able to replace up to a third of the county laptops again <laughs> so that we would do that each year and so that on a three year cycle all laptops are replaced. The same for PCs and the copiers are on a uh, six year replacement. Seven. Seven, yes. <laughs> the reason I ask is I think I'm in line. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think mine is actually four years old, but I, I haven't said anything. <laughs> well, then you are you are definitely in line. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any further questions for Rowan? <laughs> Commissioner Hawkins. Yeah, I'm just curious about uh, remote working now and workstations versus laptops and how that has changed in your budget, budgeting and 
Yeah, right. it's something that I'll definitely be taking a look at as we come into the next budget. This budget was set by former MIS director, Rena Rogers, and so it's, it's pretty established. But I think when you look at the numbers, I mean, we've definitely transitioned away from PC workstations. I think we're, the number for the total organization is 35, and we're at up to 75 on laptops. So it's mm -hmm. definitely trending that way, and, and unless there's you know, some technical or, or real operational reason why a user can't use a laptop, we're encouraging them to do so just because of the flexibility that it gives everyone. So that's kind of the way you're thinking it's going then? We're hoping to, yeah. Okay. But there are some limitations, you know, certain laptops and, and just different reasons. Some of them are public computers that live at a specific place in the building, dispatch, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a handful mm -hmm. of things that just aren't operationally practical to be a laptop, um, but for the most part, that's, that's the way we're moving. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions, comments? Madam Chair, if I could. Um, I just wanted to, to mention, we, when we were putting together the agenda, um, we talked about having this on the consent agenda because this is a budgeted item and it's on a regular re replacement schedule. And in the past, we have had it on consent, and, and that has worked. Um, but I know that frequently questions come up, like the one Commissioner Hawkins just asked, and so we, d we did put it on, uh, on the action agenda, but really it has already been approved by the board. So I just wanted to clarify that. And also, just to get some feedback from the board when we have items like this, because this also happened with the, some of the, the highway items, mm -hmm. um, when something has been budgeted already. Um, it, you know, I, I can see where, you know, when you're talking about like a, a truck with a, with a plow or a, a dump <laughs> bed, um, you're talking about a lot of money. And so I think it's probably good to revisit items like that. But for something like routine computer replacement, I'm wondering, is it the board's preference to simply leave items like that on consent, or would you prefer to have them on the action uh, list? Madam Chair, I, I would definitely prefer consent, mm -hmm. um, but I do see the value in having them on the action because we can have some discussion about it, especially with you know, a somewhat new uh, board, a new team here, understanding mm -hmm. everything I think is important. So. So I see the value there, but um, my hope is that we'll get to a place where it's it's all mm -hmm. consent, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Once I mean, if it's already been approved, of course. I mean, yeah. versus you know approving it a third time, even you know, like mm -hmm. we don't. I think right. I right. think we 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 want to streamline um, and and make our government efficient. So right. And and there's the efficiency issue, but then there's also the transparency issue. Yes. And so just right. making sure that. You know, there's adequate opportunity for for questions and, and comment. So. I think it's also important for our public when it's this type of expenditure, that level, as you say, to be really transparent and go through that one more time. So if individuals haven't had an opportunity to understand what the the cost is going to get us for the county, um, that we can further clarify that. Thank you for that. That's helpful. All right. <coughs> So we have already approved this. We really don't need to go through again, but we appreciate you coming forward and your explanation and the opportunity for us to get further information. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Rowan. Thanks, Rowan. Thank you. Thank you. Now for those big ticket items from the highway department. <laughs> big spenders. <laughs> Josh and Robbie will come up to the microphone and talk a little bit about some of their purchases and um, also some project well, awards. I don't blame you. You have six feet apart. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's right. That's right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I think Josh is going to start us off. <laughs> I've got the first one and uh, like you mentioned our our, our toys, as we call them, tend to be a little more expensive than some <laughs> other departments. <laughs> uh, the first one that we have on is some armor radio replacements. So it's a good segue uh, coming from MIS uh, because we worked with them a lot to come up with how we were going to address the replacement of our radios. I've, I'm trying to remember the exact context, but at one point I was in a meeting with Rowan and we were talking about equipment and money and I said, I've got this, I've got radios on my list and I have 
no, no plan. You know, when I first started, I'd be like, what, what's the deal with radios? Do you just buy some new radios or what? <laughs> <laughs> and he laughed like that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, no, that's for your department to budget for. And you have a lot of them. And you were one of the first departments to get them. So they are old. So that's when I kind of dug into finding out what we needed to do. Um, currently, we have 60 radios in the highway department. We have five pieces of equipment with no radio in them. Um, the recommended replacement time is seven to 10 years, and the bulk of ours were bought in 2012, so we're at <laughs> 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're at the end of um, what Rowan called the, the end of service life. Um, initially, I was calling them obsolete, and maybe that wasn't necessarily the correct language. Um, but they're end of service life. And so what he explained to me that that means is that um, they stopped making parts for our radios in 2019 and you can keep repairing them until those parts become unavailable. And now that has occurred as well. So anytime one of our radios fail, um, they need to be replaced. There basically is no repairing them, um, which is my understanding anyway. Um, also, there is some concern that a lot of them could stop working at a short period of time because most of them were bought at the same time. So they're all the same age. And um, that would be, you know, not ideal for our ability to operate if our radios are not working. Um, so then we had to start talking about money. What do these things cost? Um, they're really expensive. <laughs> they're way more than I guess I would have ever expected. Um, you know, there are no Fleet Farm walkie talkies here. <laughs> so we're looking plus or minus around $3,000 a radio. And so really, grand total, right around $200,000 to replace all of our radios. And so um, the approach we took is we started budgeting in our equipment replacement fund $50,000 per year, which was in our 2022 budget. That's our first our, uh, installment, if you will, um, so that we you know, obviously don't have to absorb that cost all at once, spread it out, make it predictable. I mean, that's been kind of our goal all along with equipment replacement. So hoping, you know, four years. Um, so we got to that point, you know, I'm working on my equipment replacements this year and I did a lot more emailing back and forth with Rowan because um, I just needed to understand a few more things like our radios are working right now and $200,000 is a lot of money and even 50,000 is a lot. So we're trying to come up with, you know, a good balanced plan of how, how to do this. Initially, we were just going to buy $50,000 worth of radios each year and just get it done. Um, but I found they, they really have no basically no trade in value. I think he said maybe a hundred dollars. Um, so it's kind of different than a skid steer or a plow truck where we're trying to find <laughs> that sweet spot where we still have some resale value, uh, reliability versus, you know, initial cost. Um, but basically these have no value or very little value after we're done with them. So in my mind, that meant we should really maximize their lifespan. So if they're still working, we should keep using them and not just buy new ones all at once. So kind of what we came up with was to um, add radios to our equipment that doesn't have them, get those five pieces of equipment with radios. Um, there's a sixth on there, uh, one of our tractors, you can barely understand what he's saying when he's in there. So that's why there's six hard mount radios in there. And then we're also replacing our bank of six uh, handheld radios. Um, we already have one bank of six that um, also work, if I remember correctly. And um, so we'll have 12 handheld radios now, six old and six new. And kind of our idea going forward is we'll continue to budget for the replacement so that we have that money if they start failing quickly. Um, but really, we're going to use those handhelds as kind of uh, a gap measure. You know, so when they, if, if two or three stop working, we can just put a handheld in that truck. We have some time to buy new radios then for those two or three. That was kind of the scenario that Rowan said might be the most possible is maybe a couple stop working at a time. And so I thought if we have enough handhelds to just cover the, you know, couple of months it takes to replace them, that's, uh, that's good enough, I think, for us. Um, kind of with the caveat that if a lot of them start failing all at once, then of course we reassess and start getting some new radios in here. Um, so that's what this first purchase is for, is for the six uh, truck mounted radios that um, to install in the equipment that doesn't have any. And then a bank of six handhelds to kind of be our backups. And then from there, we're just gonna kind of wait and see and see how long they last rather than just uh, replacing them all at once. Um, and I'd take any questions about that if you have any.
<clears throat> well, Josh, I'd like to thank you for the fact that you've spread out the costs. You're, you're being really fiscally responsible with your dollars, and you've given us a great explanation of how you're going to utilize those radios. So thanks for clarifying that. Commissioner Storley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is Motorola the only brand that's useful? I believe that is the only brand available for armor. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you have any idea when you want to order these after we approve this, I'm assuming? We want to um, order them immediately because there's a price yes. increase on the very near horizon, so we're right. trying to get the order in before yeah. that. that. The reason I ask is we have a problem with supply and demand. So hopefully, as soon as you can order them, you'll get them within a reasonable amount of time. Yep, yep, and we'll talk more about that with plow trucks, but these ones will come mm -hmm. sooner than plow trucks do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like I forget what Rowan said, maybe a a month or two, which something like that. All right, okay. acceptable. Madam Chair, I, I think I saw Rowan's hand go up. Rowan, do you have anything you want to add to I that answer? Clarify on the question about whether or not you can use other brands than Motorola, and and the answer is you you can, um, but the price is very comparable, and from just a uh, operational standpoint of from programming to maintenance to the dealers that you work with and everything it's been sort of best practice across the state to use Motorola so correct. with just it is possible to use other brands on the armor system but we do use Motorola for those reasons and we encourage our departments to buy Motorola. So I'm, sure. I'm wondering out in the townships um, are they using the same you know? They, they are. Okay. And so most of the radios purchased in the county were right around this timeline. As, as Josh said, the highway department was one of the first to go with an outright purchase for their radios. Uh, and then shortly thereafter in 2013 or 14, I believe, is when we received the FEMA AFG assistance to firefighter grant, uh, which was the vast majority of the radios in the county were purchased through that grant. And they are all of this model, this line of radio is XTS, XTL, which again, like Josh said, has reached end of service life. The reason I ask is I think it's really important because the part uh, replacement ended in 2019, so parts are not available right now. So we have some township meetings coming up, so I'll throw this out to them too. Yeah, yeah thank you. it would be a great reminder, and yeah. uh, our local 911 communications committee has, has touched on this, and I've been to multiple fire chief meetings to share this information, so Good. they should be aware, but I think for the townships, especially the board at their level, that would be a, right. a, a, good, mm -hmm. a good message for them to hear. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Swallows? Yeah, I'm just going to point out as well, well, first off, thank you for that thought process and the depth that you went into this, rather than just going a one-size-fits-all and we're just going to move forward. I thought was very thoughtful um, and also just pointing out that you're correct that generally it's it's over three thousand dollars no matter who you are trying to go in to do these buys and you guys managed to work this out that you got them at a cost less than that um, with the buy that you did and so congratulations and thank you any further discussion would someone like to entertain a motion I'll make the motion to approve the purchase of 12 armor radios for the replacement for the highway department. Is there a second? Storley support. Thank you, Commissioner Storley. There's a motion and support. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. You can get that order in this afternoon. I'll send it over <laughs> to <Brown. laughs> Thank you. Um, the next thing we are going to talk about is awarding uh, a project, which is always exciting. Uh, this is one of our uh, poorest rated bridges in the, in the county, uh, and actually in the, in the state, to be fair enough. Uh, and I'm excited to get this done. Uh, so this next, this coming summer, uh, we'll be able to do the Carlson Creek Bridge replacement. Uh, it's off of Moose, Rally Ro Moose Valley Road, uh, up near Hovland. Um, this uh, project, if you read a little bit on it, is uh, one of the roads that we had redesignated uh, as a UT route. And so instead of being originally, this was going to get paid for through our transportation sales tax funds, uh, either that or some type of us just saving up money through the levy and trying to do it that way. Uh, but because of this redesignation, we are able to utilize uh, the town bridge account from the state. We've talked a lot about that, but 
this is a shining example of almost, you know, a little under half a million dollars that Cook County does not have to spend. Um, so that's kind of awesome. Um, and I'm very happy we were all <laughs> able to work together to get that done. Uh, and we'll talk about a bigger project later uh, that also utilizes that. But if you look at, um, you know, the, the bid tally on there, I'm sure the questions will come up regarding uh, why our engineer's estimate was almost double. Um, <laughs> the other way, it's the opposite problem that we had from last summer. Um, and this is something we've been working on internally quite a bit. Uh, it was interesting when we were going through the bid. One, I'm very happy we got five bids. Uh, that's amazing. Um, and so I think there's, there's a lot that goes into coming up with these estimates and so many things that are very variable. Um, you can look at project location, the timing of not only just in Cook County, but where in Cook County. Um, the timing of the bid letting. So we did this, you know, early winter, which is generally when people are wrapping up construction season um, and looking for projects into the next, you know, summer. So hopefully, you know, I think this is an example of getting in when prices are good. Uh, the type of project, you know, if this was a bigger bridge project, and we'll you can talk about that again with the Cross River one, you know, you can see we had two bidders versus this one is a concrete box culvert. You had five bidders. So it's a little more, maybe more people can do it. Um, contractor schedules, as I had mentioned, plays into it. If somebody's really busy, maybe they're just going to throw in a number and great if they get it, you know. Um, and then the other thing too is honestly, contractors are setting these prices. They're setting competitive prices. So if somebody can say, hey, I can do this for 5,000 bucks and somebody, you know, everybody else might say 20,000 bucks, mm -hmm. you know, we have no way to predict that. Um, I did spend some time going over just the low bid uh, that we received from, from Ulan Brothers and then also a couple other places that we get uh, prices from. So one is the state average price, so the trunk highway system, uh, what that is. Uh, there's another way to look at district pricing, so like us in Lake County, Carlton, St. Louis, you know, at least the Arrowhead and see, you know, how much things cost there. Uh, how does that compare to the trunk highway? How does that compare to our bids? And this is an art. It's fascinating uh, to <laughs> look at this. Um, I, I wish I had, co not coherent, I wish I had concise answers on this already because it's all over the place. Um, if I look at, you know, even if, I, if you would have said, take trunk highway prices, just MnDOT state average prices, which I would never do. We are not state average up here. Um, I still would have been over. $150,000. <laughs> so we'd still be having this conversation. Um, so yeah, I think great news. We got, I think this thing getting uh, replaced is going to be great. I think the price we got on it is wonderful, obviously. Um, and so I would uh, recommend awarding uh, to you and brothers, I guess. Are there any other questions yeah. that we may have for Robbie? All right. If not, is there a motion by resolution to award the project to Ulan Brothers? I would make that motion. Thank you, Commissioner Stolison. Is there support? Support. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. We have a motion and support. Any further discussion? I'll, Madam Chair, all this good news is making me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, where is it going? I, I can help you with that. <laughs> 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 All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations. One is done. One is done. Thank you. And All right. Think back to Josh. <laughs> All right. Two more pieces of equipment on the list here. The next one is the replacement of one of our uh, standard large plow trucks, uh, the, the big yellow ones you see on the road. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add for this other than it's, you know, it's, we land, we discussed the equipment plan quite a bit and we're at that buying one a year is kind of our current plan to get them all on a 14 year replacement schedule. Um, we readjusted our budget number, you know, before, before the budget came to you, you know, of course we've discussed how we have kind of our estimates mapped out for two decades to come. And um, prices really went up this year and we kind of saw that coming um, especially most of the iron that goes on the truck really went up a lot. Um, I was trying to find 
the exact number and I couldn't find it, but all of, all of these things are bought off the state negotiated contract. And really that's the simplest, best way to, for us to buy equipment. All of the specifications are done, um, all the competitive bidding is done, and then they just put out a list and we can buy. And the, for us to come up with that on our own would be extremely time consuming and we probably would spend more, to be honest. Um, so that's how we buy it. And the reason I bring that up is because there is a clause in there for suppliers to change their prices mid-contract if their raw materials meet a certain uh, increase, and that happened. And in over a decade of doing this, I, I didn't even know that was a possibility. So it's very rare. Um, but Tomaster, who puts the box and the plows and everything on the truck, had to send us an amended quote. I think even the, the attachment's probably called amended um, because they had to raise their price because they met whatever that threshold is from the state to where they can renegotiate because their costs have gone up so much. Um, so I looked up last year's truck. This truck is the exact same. Same truck, same additions, everything. Last year was 254,694. Um, this year, 276,565. So 8% increase roughly. Um, and again, we, we, we had budgeted for 280, kind of anticipating this increase, and I made sure we stayed under our budgeted amount for this year. Um, but it's, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate the increase in cost, and equally as unfortunate is the actually receiving the truck. <laughs> so the truck we ordered this time last year is still not here. It's not even close to being here. Um, it was supposed to be delivered in October, and the cabin chassis from Mac hadn't even arrived to the Twin Cities yet in October. Um, it came in December. So there may be, if we're lucky, just starting to build the rest of the truck. Um, and so this one, um, I, put in, I can put in a soft order with Towmaster where it's just kind of a, um, a commitment that we have a plan to order one. They understand it has to be board approved and budget and all that, but they'll give us a spot. And so the spot for this truck um, the plan is the cabin chassis should come early fall and the truck will get built spring of 23. So we're really way out on plow trucks. And as you might imagine, or I've heard, um, parts are not easy to get either. So we're not necessarily at a, a crisis, but it's certainly concerning um, how hard it is to get parts and how hard it is to get new trucks, because one or the other is pretty necessary. <laughs> so we're ordering our next truck. I would love to see it sooner, but I'm not planning on it. Um, and um, I just, you know, I guess I'd just like to stay on track with our, our one a year and get those orders in in January every year. And hopefully one of these days things will settle down and they'll start coming in a reasonable time again. Um, but uh, this is our, our most important piece of equipment. I think I put that in the agenda item. Really, we're trying to maximize reliability of these trucks. And, um, you know, so it's not like the radios where you know, if a few don't work, ah, we can make do. These are really critical. I, I would hope everyone agrees that this is our most important piece of equipment that needs to be reliable. And so that's why we've, we're set on making sure that we're replacing them at a regular interval. Any questions or comments for Josh? Commissioner Mills. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and whereas, you know, it's bad news that it's an increase both in the cost and the and the time uh, timeline, I, I, I just want to reemphasize that it, it is under budget, and um, and so I see that as as great news, um, me being me. But thank you for for explaining it all, and uh, yeah, it is uh, concerning and and stressful just to hear about um, those supply issues. But um, really appreciate um, um, staying the course and trying to keep our plan as level as we can. So thank you. Any other further comments? Commissioner Hawkins. I just want to thank you for the work that you guys do to really make sure that you are being responsible with money and looking at ways to make sure the taxpayers are not paying for too much. I appreciate that. And this is an example. I think, Mr. Yorkey, when we were talking about what should be on a consent agenda, mm -hmm. I get we we approved you guys to do this, mm -hmm. but it really is helpful to me and I think the public to hear the struggles that you've gone through and, the, and your thought process. I, I just really appreciate hearing that. So I appreciate that this was not on a consent agenda. Thank you very much. And um, knowing that we have a cab, we have parts, we have all kinds of concerns, 
Um, and this is a good statement to make in Cook County. We're not out of the woods yet. <laughs> but let's get this ordered. Is there a motion? Oh, so moved. Thank you, Commissioner Mills. Is there support? Swallowson supports. Thank you, Commissioner Swallowson. So we have a motion and support. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right. All right. The last uh, piece of equipment is a little smaller plow truck. And um, you may or may not recall, we actually came last fall, I think November, mm -hmm. if I remember right, to approve the cabin chassis order um, for this year. So that has already been ordered. Uh, I believe that's looking at June, maybe, to receive it. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, the, the smaller kind of package that goes on these trucks is a little more readily available, so I didn't feel the need to approve that ahead of time. So this is just the, uh, you know, the small dump box, the spreader, the hydraulics, um, again, from Towmaster off uh, state contract, um, just kind of the, the rest of the outfitting for this truck. Um, the one kind of hitch with this one is Towmaster doesn't do small plows, which is very inconvenient. So this truck will actually have to go to a third uh, truck equipment company to get a plow put on it. Um, but we'll probably just, um, again, go on state bid and catch uh, probably United Truck Body in Duluth and get a plow put on it. So we're, there'll be one more step left for this one, but this is the, the bulk of the cost, of course, is the cabin chassis and the box and spreader. Um, we're replacing a pretty old, pretty rough truck with this. Um, it's maybe not as critical of a piece of equipment as our big plows, but we use it a fair amount and it's, it's due. Um, it breaks down quite regularly and I'm really looking forward to having the new replacement. All right, any questions for Josh? Not I'd entertain a motion. I'll make the motion to approve the purchase of the dump box and sand spreader for the uh, one ton Ford F550. And is there support? support. Thank you, Commissioner Storley. <coughs> Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Great. All right. Now we're on to our Cross River Bridge Project Award. Yes, another town bridge account. So this one, if everybody remembers from last summer, was a mm. bid we actually rejected. Um, that was the one. So Cross River Bridge, it's on North Gunflint Lake Road, basically at the end of the trail, hangar right just before the resort. That little um, wooden bridge. Yes, <laughs> that is, again, one of the worst in the county and the state. Um, so we're working on getting those replaced. But yeah, having the, this one is another big one. Uh, MnDOT is the one that came through a couple of years ago, I believe, and those big steel beams that are on there trying to hold the thing up. Yeah, no, nope, that's time to go. Um, so uh, yeah, I was excited uh, to get this back on here to redesignate the road, see that it qualified for the town bridge account, and similar to the almost half a million dollars from Carlson Creek, this will end up being 1.4 million dollars. Um, that again, Cook County does not have to spend um, on infrastructure, which is super cool. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, this is one. You know, this is uh, kind of your more stereotypical bridge. So maybe there's not as many people, not as many contractors, um, especially up here, that can handle that type of project or do it. So you can see we ended up with two bids, which is still one more than we got last year, and I'll take that. Um, as far as our estimate is concerned, you can see we came in a little 1.24 million, um, and the low uh, bid here ended up being just under 1.4. It's about a 12% difference. Personally, I'm very happy with that. <laughs> um, a lot of times, you know, when I've worked with, with the state, it's, it's kind of like a, it's a little bit of a gray area. Obviously, you want it, the closer you are, the better. Generally, it's about a 15%. If you can be within 15%, you're pretty good to go. Um, and so that's where in this regard, I know that as you get higher in the dollar amount, the difference can seem like a lot, but percentage-wise, you might be within it. And so you know, for all the reasons that I had mentioned before. But, so I was very happy to see these come in. Um, yeah, I guess I would recommend or ask to award uh, the Cross River Project to Redstone Construction, and I'll entertain any questions, obviously, too. Commissioner Mills. <laughs> Madam Chair, um, thank you, and, and thank you, Robbie. Um, looks like we're s saving $100,000 from the previous um, bid where we re rejected, is that? Yeah, yeah, so this, yeah, so the previous 
bid, I guess to go back into it some more. So the previous bid would have been, and this is last year before we redesignated the roads. Mm -hmm. uh, that, so it was County Road 46. Now it's UT 46, mm -hmm. um, which those two letters make a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so last year's bid, I believe, was like 1.5, I think, mm -hmm. um, somewhere in there. And so, yeah, so about $100,000 difference from, from last year. Um, yeah, so that's awesome. Thank you for that right. recommendation. And yes. then again, the whole redesignation of the UT um, system is just saving, saving, saving again. Uh -huh. This good news is uh -huh. <laughs> overwhelming. <laughs> Absolutely. Very much so. <laughs> it's one of the few things that's gone down in price yeah. that I'm aware of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say that. <laughs> Any other further questions or comment for Robbie? If not, I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. Is there support? Storley support. Thank you, Commissioner Storley. We have motion and support. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Awesome. Thank you very All much. All right. Thank you. And now on to our request for something that happened this past weekend. Correct. <laughs> so <laughs> I already called them, uh, <laughs> kind of said, hey, you know, what's going on here? Obviously, the board needs to approve these type of permits before set event happens. Um, and so they were, I think I called Beth uh, Ambrosian up there. And uh, no, she was great. She completely was like, I totally forgot. And so I had talked to her about, um, you know, just wanting from, from our end of things, the things we're concerned about, you know, traffic control, how are you handling, you know, county road crossings um, and, and that stuff. And we talked and I felt comfortable enough with what she had explained to me um, that I was okay with, with signing the permit, I guess. Um, and so I guess for, for now, I don't know if this is just a formality at this point or for information, per we all knew the mail run happened and go cook county mushers at that regard. But um, <laughs> yeah, any questions, I guess, I don't, yeah kind of weird <laughs> no questions for me I want to thank our highway department I was in the caravan behind the plow that went down the Gunflint Trail Ooh. heading towards um, Trail Center so thank you for clearing the way for uh, the mushers the volunteers and all the spectators um, everybody was kind of waiting to see that plow go up <laughs> so thank you for that any other uh, questions or comments uh, Madam Chair, and, and th thank you for for working working um, on this and and with them. And um, you know, it's a it's a very wonderful community event. I I still w just want to make sure that you know we're doing things uh, as as we should be. And so I um, I trust that their lesson was learned and and that they they know that. I hope so. Don't yes. yeah. Don't do. <laughs> don't just do things. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's that's just my only only comment, right. but uh, very excited to follow it and and hear the news of it though as well. So uh, very successful event and um, really really appreciate the work that was done. Absolutely, Commissioner Hawkins. Yeah, um, I I appreciate that you worked with them too, and I see where things can be in an oversight. I get that. Yeah, done that myself. But <laughs> I'm just wondering, do we have a policy that if there is another group out there that does something and doesn't get a permit, do we have a procedure to deal with that? I honestly don't know. Okay. <laughs> I Just, know, you know, okay. when I was reading, you know, reading through the permit, there is, you know, some guidelines at the beginning of it that do say, you know, please do this like two months ahead of time. You know, and so obviously when we received this and, you know, it's kind of like, okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure uh, what, you know, obviously I'm not going to sit here and be like, you can't do the mail run. Like that would be a little, that's a little ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if there needs to be more outreach on our part, you know, or if it's more, or is it just specifically on the event holders? Maybe that's something um to figure out and you know we could talk about it in like public safety you know committee level and try and s see maybe if there's a better way to get this I think that's an appropriate way to approach it you know yeah. having a checklist for the people that are organizing the event and managing mm -hmm. the event 
and that's maybe the first thing on there or one of the first things. Um, they establish the date, then they get a permit because it's probably going to result in liability issues if mm -hmm. something does happen. I think we're very lucky and very fortunate nothing did happen. Um, I know there was an incident with Wisconsin this past weekend where a musher and their dogs um, were hit by a snowmobile and mm -hmm. Um, we want to avoid those kinds of things. So I think just stress, st stressing with the event organizers that this needs to be one of the first steps that's taken. Yeah. No, I think that'd be good to discuss, too. And if it's, you know, giant blinking thing on the website when you hop on there right away or something, I don't know what. But, <laughs> you know, there's obviously the, the events we know about, and it's always the ones that you don't know about. So I Correct. think you know, there's some balance of our own reaching out versus, you know, making it accessible for event planners to know, like, you need to do this. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Madam yeah, Chair, sure. one, one further thought, and again, I, I, I shouldn't say again. I don't know if this is appropriate, but um, we have a very uh, strong and cohesive uh, um, um, tourist industry, and, and um, uh, perhaps there is uh, further conversations uh, with Visica County that could happen to try to make sure that all of our events are, are, are getting taken care of as, as best they see. But... Um, yeah, I think that's very For appropriate, and I know I am on the um, Gunfront Trail Scenic Byway Group. That's something we can bring up there. Gunflint Trail Association as well. Um, so I will do that on my end um, to make sure that the word gets <coughs> out. All right. Well, I think that that is really all we need. I don't think there's any approval required at this point. Um, any further questions regarding the Gunflint mail run? Thank, thank you both thank very you. much. You. Appreciate all your work. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for keeping our roads cleared. You've had <laughs> a busy season so far. <laughs> <laughs> nice to get a little break this week. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, at this point, um, does anyone need a break? Madam Chair, I'd appreciate a break. Thank all you. All right. We will take... Um, a five minute break and we'll see you back here shortly. Thank you. And Tim Nelson is in the room. So <laughs> <laughs> we took a break. We got our new process going now. Oh, we're doing new year. Water. We're making Brady wait. <laughs> I'm here, I'll take a break too. <laughs> Go ahead, Brady. Yes, I'll do the Yeah, well, the semester's always been harder out because they're the best. Yeah, well, so it goes, but it's been like six to eight months, not eight, not a year. Yeah. Great job, guys. Thank you. Appreciate <coughs> Thank it. Thank you. Really yeah, it was, it's kind of funny with some of that, you know, like we understand like, like consent agenda stuff, right, you know, but it is a good point when you're talking quarter of a million, half a million dollar things to be like, well, we should talk about it. <laughs> it makes sense too. Yeah. You know. Maybe, I guess I'd suggest just let me know what, what number triggers that so that I don't put it on consent if there's a certain threshold um, that yeah. oh, yeah. you want an item instead. I don't, I don't think it's hard to make I also think it just, you know, in some cases, I mean, it's like a much smaller expense if it's slightly over budget, that may be a situation where you can have that smaller item <coughs> on the regular Sure. Um, where, you know, I'd be more comfortable with the more yeah. expensive arguments coming. No, but we are not going to be more comfortable with the lower. It's nice to talk about hey, we're saving money. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's yeah. the kind of discussion. It's really not he's less about getting it through, but we're more just sharing information about the process and how it <coughs> made it different from what we're expecting in terms of cost or availability, you know, equipment timelines, that kind of thing. <laughs> Where did you camp then? You're in the dog. Duncan. Oh, all right. First, we got the first site to the left. We we're just kind of hustling because we weren't sure how many people were going to break the cold, and we wanted that spot. But yeah. that's great. And this time here, you don't have to worry about all the bear that are up there. Yeah, we laughed about that. That, that. that poor bear probably starved to death after they closed the boundary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because we were out there 
in August, right before they closed the boundary walks, and that bear was working the campsite. Yeah, and they were. You could hear it going. Everybody who paddles up there knows that bear. Yeah, in a way, I pat, um, paddled and camped on logs, and <laughs> it's just like that bear just travels the portage, yep. swims a little bit, yep. visits everybody. Yeah, and it's one thing if you know it and you've got some experience with it, and you got an idea of, of that, of the temperament and you put of that your food bear. Up or right. you have well, and those are always a must. They're resistant containers. Yeah, but, but I mean, even even at that, when you follow all the rules, when you see one and you don't, you don't know what the temperament of that bear is. You don't know if they're, you know, somebody that's going to cause some mischief or what's going to go on. I, I've experienced, you know, several different <laughs> ones. That, some of them they're around and you see them, and you know, as long as they're finding what they want, they're perfectly happy. And others, yeah, it's they're just into everything, and it doesn't matter. And they're out there in the middle of the night making noise. And, uh -huh. We had, we, my dad made sure we had the equipment, um, and, and I got to say I'd done it several times when I was a kid, but the thought nowadays doesn't even begin to, I mean, it's like, no, no thanks. I like, I like my, uh, my warm house with fireplace and... Invite them back up front. <laughs> Maybe if I was 20 or something. <laughs> yeah, we had, yeah, we had, you know, you rent the hot tent from Stone Harbor and it has a little wood burner in the corner. But the, you know, we're burning dry cedar, it goes out in an hour. Uh -huh. And then, yeah, and then we brought a buddy heater too. And I put the propane tank outside, like you're supposed to do. Well, that froze. That stopped working in the middle. Oh, of the yeah, but sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> sorry. Near stores later. Well, I'll stop by. Right. Well played, Adam. Well played. Yeah. Well played. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of being a taskmaster. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> we get it. <laughs> All right. Well, everyone is back with us, and is Auditor Powers on the line? Madam Chair, I'm here. Great. All right, yeah. we are back and we'll resume with our meeting after our short and interesting break. Um, at this point, we would like to turn the meeting over to Auditor Powers. And Brady, before you start, I just want to check with April. April, if you can let us know if the audio is coming through on the phone, that would be great. Go ahead, Brady. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the first item is a uh, grant contract approval for a septic system at the airport. Um, I'm sure 
you're all aware of this. The, the airport has needed a septic system for some time. It's been difficult to find contractors to complete those jobs. But uh, this grant um, was available and from the state, and it got encumbrance approval uh, on November 23rd. They did that in advance so that we could uh, squeeze this in and get it done prior to uh, the freeze up and the heavy snows, which uh, the airport uh, accomplished with Rod Roy's help. So this is a fully a state grant, um, 30,000. Uh, 457.87, and it's 75 percent of the cost. And uh, I'll just leave it at that for questions. All right. Any questions for Auditor Powers? <clears throat> Commissioner Storley. Um, Brady, who's actually doing the septic system? Or did I miss this in the? That that was um, uh, Jed Smith, I believe. Oh. Yes. Is it local? Correct. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, he has a um, septic and excavating company that's located uh, right across from Headstrom Lumber. Oh, okay. Yeah, he is, uh, when you do a septic, which I did myself this fall, he is uh, one of those on the uh, list that uh, the Environmental Health Department gives you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was lucky that someone was available to do it. It was really a struggle this year. I know personally um, <laughs> to get one done. So, <laughs> really grateful they could get that in. And that was a squeeze. That was pretty late. So, absolutely. Any other questions for Auditor Powers? If not, I'd entertain a motion. <clears throat> so, move, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Mills. Is there support? Storley support. Thank you, Commissioner Storley. We have a motion and support. Any further questions or discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And now on to airport maintenance grant agreement. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. This is a, now it's a standard two-year agreement. They increased the, the amount uh, a couple of years ago. And so now it's about uh, 41,000, almost 41 and a half each year for two years. And it covers 75% of eligible uh, maintenance costs. It's coming to you late right now. They were, they were late coming out with their grants. And then they, they sent this one in early November. This is why I put it on. Some people might have been aware of that. And I simply was busy with uh, bonding and, uh, and abatements, et cetera, and I missed it. So I just became aware of it a couple of weeks ago and got it on the agenda now for approval. It's not, it's not late. There's no implications, but it could have, been, could have been done a little earlier. So that's why I put it on the, uh, this agenda, in case there were questions on that. So just our standard maintenance grant. They asked for approval of that. Uh, again by resolution. All right. Any questions or discussion? If not, I'd like a motion for the resolution for the airport maintenance grant. I move. Thank you, Commissioner Spallison. Is there support? Support. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Mills. We have a motion and support. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much, Auditor Powers. Thank you. All right, we'll move I'm now. I'm going to go back to YouTube now. <laughs> <laughs> have, have fun watching us. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to item number nine, um, Administrator Yorkie. Yes. Good morning, commissioners and members of the public. Uh, the first item under my section is a request that uh, we received also last year from the uh, Laurentian Resource Conservation Development Group for a uh, request for annual dues in the amount of $400. Um, it was the board's decision last year not to, uh, to pay the dues. And uh, I think the, the rationale at that point was that the county wasn't really getting the value from that, from that uh, payment. So um, 
again, you, you have the uh, request letter in your agenda packet, and uh, we're just seeking a decision on whether or not to, to pay that request. <coughs> So I would just like to indicate that I did um, do some research last year and um, again this year. I also talked to um, both our commissioner, former commissioner and representative from Soil and Water who had attended the meetings. They did not feel that they were productive meetings, um, particularly as it pertains to Cook County and felt it really wasn't worth the time and the drive to Duluth. Um, so I did wanna share those remarks that they gave me and uh, wonder if there are other commissioners that have other comments or remarks or questions. Madam Chair, my only question is, um, do they meet during the year? I mean, uh, they just- there, uh, there is a meeting schedule. Um, there's a new one that is posted for 2022. Mm -hmm. um, we have not been approached by the group, even though um, you know we've been with them in the past. Um, so there has not been effective communication, which was one of the remarks that was shared by our former uh, board member that was on that group. Commissioner Mills. Madam Chair, I think, I think there's a lot of potential here, and, and it's, some, it's something that I think would be a really good fit for Cook County, and so I'm discouraged to hear that um, it's not an effective group, but um, in, until it is, uh, or in, until... Uh, you know, there's better communication or, or, or um, a, a real clear path forward for, for us. Um, I, think, I think it's appropriate that we, we uh, stay, stay out of it and try to put our energy towards, towards things that are more productive, Absolutely. Unfo unfortunately. Absolutely. But, yeah. And I, you know, by um, visiting, I really support their mission and purpose, mm -hmm. um, but would like to um, try to build a relationship and in the future, if things change, um, reconsider. And Madam Chair, if I may, we, we can join at any point. So Absolutely. if things change, we can we can join up again. Correct. Mm -hmm. Commissioners Follison. I have a motion to deny the request from the Laurentian Resource Conservation <coughs> for annual use. Is there a second to that motion? Support. Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. There's been a motion and support. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion carries. Administrator updates. All right. <clears throat> um, so a few things on uh, my list this morning. Um, last October, um, the board received a presentation from Tessa Melvin, who's with David Drown Associates, regarding options for compensation and classification study. Um, and we have committed to our labor unions that we are going to be undertaking a uh, class and comp study in the first part of 22 to uh, look at our, our pay structure, to look at positions and make sure that everything's aligned with what's happening in the market. And that's especially important now, um, as you know, because of the issues that we talked about earlier in the meeting, uh, where there's a lot of churn going on in the em employment market. Um, a lot of people are moving um, from, from job to job, uh, rates of pay are going up, and it's really uh, important for the, the viability of our organization and our, and our ability to provide high quality services that we have staff who are appropriately compensated for their work. Um, and so that's, that's really uh, a big part of why we're doing this. I mean, the other thing is the last time we did a comp study was five years ago and it's recommended uh, that you do a comp study every five years or so just to make sure that your, uh, your salary and benefits offerings are aligned with what's available in the market. So uh, this is just a good, a good business practice to undertake. Um, and tomorrow, uh, Leah Ekstrom and I are going to have a conference call with uh, Tessa at David Drown to talk about uh, steps to move forward. Um, and I would expect to, uh, I hope to bring a, a contract proposal forward to the board at the next meeting uh, that would enable us to move forward um, this this study has been a topic of conversation in our labor union negotiations and uh, we are firmly committed to doing this work and i know the unions are counting on it um, so the sooner we can get the ball rolling the better so that's that's where that effort stands and if there are questions i'd be happy to answer them any questions for administrator york 
Um, Madam Chair, I don't, I don't have a question, but I, I, um, my experience with DDA has been very positive, although I have had concerns about the comp study done by DDA, and so I'm not sure how, uh, maybe it's a difference in expectations, maybe it's a, a difference in process. I'm not sure how to best address that. I have full faith and confidence in, in your abilities, and I know you've heard those concerns as well, um, but I just want to make sure that you know we're as transparent as we can be, mm -hmm. and that we include as many um, uh, as as many uh, employees as possible, or, or or representation from the the labor groups uh, in in this um, process. And so I just want to emphasize that that's where you know kind of my vantage is at this point mm -hmm. is, is the inclusive inclusivity of of the labor groups there. Yes, and Commissioner Mills, I, I did hear the same comment that you heard about mm -hmm. the uh, the concerns about uh, one study that, that David Drown did, uh, perhaps having reached a foregone conclusion, right. or having been based on a foregone conclusion. Yeah. Um, that's really not my interest at right. all. Yeah. Um, we want to make sure, again, as, as the leader of this organization, I want to make sure that our, our staff are receiving competitive wages and benefits because we can't develop or we can't deliver high quality services if if we're not offering competitive compensation um, so that's vitally important and i agree with you completely that we need to this needs to be a very transparent process we do need to engage staff throughout so that they understand for example the comps that we're using to to determine where we stand um, and, and so that, that engagement is going to be a big part of how we do the study. Great. That's wonderful to hear, and I, I just want <coughs> as many people to hear that as possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, thank you. Other comments or questions? Anything else, Administrator Yerke? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. The, the next thing I wanted to mention is that um, we do have an RFP drafted um, that I'm going to be sharing with the Building Committee and also the uh, the Capital Advisory Committee uh, to to uh, recruit a firm to help us with the update of our capital improvement plan. Um, as folks, as you all, and, and probably folks who are listening may recall. Uh, about four years ago or so, we developed a CIP with uh, assistance from Wold Architects. And um, we were looking at the possibility of uh, working with Wold again on the update of the CIP. And we did get some feedback from, from our budget advisory committee that they felt it would be preferable for us to, to go out to request proposals. Um, and so that's what we're doing. Um, and I do want to get both the Budget Advisory Committee's feedback and also our internal Building Committee uh, feedback on the RFP before we send that out. Um, but that's another front burner issue that, that we're going to be working on this, this year because, um, Commissioner Hawkins, I've heard you say several times that we need a plan, and I couldn't agree with that more. Um, we do need a plan that uh, takes into account our fiscal constraints, that identifies the highest priority needs in terms of our building, our buildings, and uh, that lays out a path for us to address those needs. So um, <clears throat> that <clears throat> that's something that will be coming forward um, in the next meeting or two. Good. Yeah. That's very encouraging. Um, related note, uh, strategic plan. I did follow up with Roger Reinert. Um, <clears throat> this is something that um, we had intended to get underway at the end of last year, and frankly circumstances made that impossible. The staff departures, um, we just had too many holes in the net <laughs> to, really, to really move forward on that. And um, we're really in no different position now than we were back in the late fall with, with lots of staff vacancies. Um, people are spread really thin. And the development of a strategic plan is something that has to, if it's gonna be a good plan, it has to involve a lot of staff input. And my concern right now is that we are just so, so thin that putting one more thing on the plates of, of our uh, departmental leaders and, and our frontline staff just would not be reasonable. It wouldn't be fair, it wouldn't generate a good outcome. So um, I, I, I'm uh, working with, with Mr. Reiner to determine a time that we could start that effort, um, perhaps around mid-year, maybe May or June. 
um, once these other two issues that I just talked about are kind of underway and, and hopefully close to being resolved. Um, Madam Chair, before we, before we go any, any further, sorry to go back, it's just how mm -hmm. my mind works sometimes. Um, I, I, heard, I heard you say, Mr. Yorkie, just that um, you know, every five years it's, it's appropriate to do um, the comp study. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to clarify from what I've heard in some of the AMC trainings. Um, uh, maybe it was two years ago uh, or three years ago, actually, the annual conference. Um, it's actually three to five years. Mm -hmm. And so we're kind of on the tail end of that. And um, now having gone through the labor negotiations um, once and um, hopefully largely twice, um, it's interesting because, um, you know, three-year contracts seem to be kind of the, the hope or, or the kind of something we should, you know, ideally strive for. And, um, and I know the, the expectations for the comp study vary as well, and I don't know how appropriate that is t to be either ahead of negotiations or within negotiations or <coughs> you know timed with that it's just an interesting uh, set of numbers there and so just something that we might want to consider as we we move forward um, once we hopefully get all um, employees uh, or most uh, on kind of that same page with understanding that this is a fair process and that um, we do have comparables that most can agree with um, we hopefully won't have to do as in-depth of a study, and maybe we can do it more frequently, uh, easier and more cheaply uh, um, to, to maybe keep it in line with our negotiation cycle as well. So mm -hmm. sorry to backtrack there, but it was just no, uh, good. Uh, a thought I had. So yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> and, and you're right, it is three to five years is the recommendation that I've heard. I was just kind of... yep. <laughs> abbreviating that a little bit. Um, so, and uh, mentioning the, the contracts, so we are um, getting close. We, we do have tentative agreement on one contract and expect to shortly have tentative agreement on the second contract. Um, I'm waiting to hear back from the, the second bargaining unit um, on its consideration of our offer there. And then um, there's a, there are ongoing negotiations with the third union. Um, I'm not sure where we stand on that one. Um, there, there's still some differences of perspective in, in the conversations we've been having there. Um, but I'm hoping to hear back from that group as well. Um, I would, at this point, it looks to me like I would be able to bring forward um, two, two contracts for board approval at the meeting on January 25th. Um, last year, we, we brought forward all three contracts, I believe, at the same time. Um, I, and I don't know if there's a, a need or a benefit to do the same thing this time, but my, my feeling is if we have tentative agreements on two contracts that we should probably go ahead and get those executed. So, um, that's, that's my thought on that. I certainly would agree with that and, and look forward to those being on the next agenda. Um, those are the, the big things that I'm working on. There are lots of little things, of course, always. Um, we are starting to see, of course, um, like the entire community, we're starting to see uh, staff uh, shortages related to what's going on with, with COVID. Um, and that's something that we are working through right now. Um, it is conceivable that this could impact our operations in terms of having to cur curtail hours, which um, I saw that the, uh, the pharmacy up at the clinic, for example, has shortened its hours for that reason. Um, and I c can imagine that we might find ourselves in the same position. Um, if that does become necessary, we'll be communicating with, uh, with folks through our local media outlets, the News Herald, Boreal, uh, the radio station, and also Facebook uh, to, to let folks know if those changes are necessary. Any further questions on the updates? All right, we'll move on to employee concerns, commissioner concerns. <coughs> Any commissioner reports or meeting updates? Commissioner Stoke. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a few things, but I have something on the front burner right now, and that's 
because I've been receiving um, quite a few phone calls about the disparity situation that we're in. It's, for some businesses, it's really terrible. Mm -hmm. So um, I did, there was a really good article in um, last week's Cook County paper, both by um, Auditor Powers, kind of trying to describe what's going on. It's so complicated. And then visit Cook County and um, the chamber working together. So I did call Jim yesterday and I understand there's a meeting this coming Thursday morning with um, Judy Erickson, who is our representative at the um, legislature, and Senator Bach and Representative Eklund. And he said, if nothing else, could we email both Bach and Eklund to say, do something. So if we all have time, just to send a short note off to them, however you feel about this, I'm not telling you how to feel, but um, just, you know, to say, um, we're concerned. And I don't know if Administrator Yorkie, if you're gonna be uh, involved in that, or you're working with Lake County mm -hmm. also. Right. And the teamwork, I think, is really important in this situation. May not be able to do anything for this, for this year, but um, hopefully for the future, that this does not come around again for um, businesses. Okay, so I'll check that off. On to, um, um, Eller's really good workshop seminar coming up the first week of February. My calendar is open and I am willing to look into it. With the variant going on, I'm not real sure. I did call down there on Friday. She said that there's no time limit as far as registering. Um, they have a, a hotel room available for people. It is an overnighter. So, you know, with, um, with their topics of tax abatement and bond case studies and legislative updates and leadership, I really uh, hope that um, I can squeeze it in in terms of weather and in terms of health. Mm -hmm. So I did ask, you know, uh, about how many people did she think would be coming and she thought, there again, because of all of this, maybe 150 so far I registered. Um, I said, what kind of rooms do you have for this? And she said, they're quite large rooms, so you don't feel like you're crammed into a little space with a lot of people. So that was reassuring. So if I may, I'll just kind of put this on the agenda for the next couple weeks and, and you know, then uh, maybe go ahead and have April make the uh, arrangements for me to go down. Right. Okay, so when we received the, the uh, update from Assessor Bob um, to put aside a, a June um, <clears throat> date, I thought maybe we should also think about our dates with AMC, district meetings, um, conferences and all that. So I do have a list of, you know, starting in March, going into April, June, September and December. So maybe I'll just send that off to April and she can get it all off to us. It was put in, you know, if you could read the fine print in this little booklet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's where I took it from, was right. from AMC. So that we all get that on our calendars so that we can say, we don't want to get in the situation we did last time with AMC in December and then having to change it and Brady was very accommodating on that. But that's a given, always mm -hmm. the first week of December is mm -hmm. AMC conference. So um, I think that's all I'm gonna check off my list. Well, and I'd like to thank you, Commissioner Storley, for stepping up with the Ellers presentation. Mm -hmm. I looked at that being in conflict with our tribal relations right. training and was really concerned that we wouldn't have anyone there. So thank you for, um, you know, making an effort to do that and be there for us. You're welcome. We really appreciate that. Other commissioners? Madam Chair, I, I just want to uh, thank the board uh, for the work that we did in our organizational meeting. Um, I did not realize um, the weight of uh, last year until I now am sitting outside <laughs> of the chair, vice chair seat, and uh, it, I feel like a new man. 
<laughs> and, uh, and it's just wonderful. So thank you so much for, for the work that you're doing and stepping up and, and serving. Uh, I greatly appreciate it and taking on additional uh, committees. I, I greatly appreciate that as well. Uh, and I just hope that we can um, you know, continue discussions as need be uh, moving ahead if, if we find conflicts or if we, we see other needs um, or, or shuffling or whatever. I just, uh, yeah, just very grateful. So thank you. Absolutely. Anything else? Commissioner Hawkins. I would just like to report of the extension committee meeting we had yesterday. Um, and I'm just very excited. Sarah is going to be coming on board, back on board, mm -hmm. <laughs> in a few weeks. And I think I want to recognize Sally Berg for her work up there yep. and Julie working up there. Um, and I'm just very excited about the possibilities for the extension services in our community going forward. I, I think we have a lot of hard work to do, but I think uh, I'm, I'm just very encouraged and I wanted to share that. Well, thank you much, Commissioner Hawkins. All right. Commissioner Swallison, anything? Um, I'd just like to um, refer to our correspondence or memos that are on the agenda. We have something from Visit Cook County. And that came as a result of my conversation with Linda Jurek. Um, as you recall, at our organizational meeting, we wanted to check out, first of all, if Commissioner Swallison and Commissioner Storley, if that should be one position with Visit Cook County and the Chamber are separate. Linda really likes the idea of keeping them very separate, which mm -hmm. is um, great. And then she also was very excited to see that Stacy had um, indicated that she as a commissioner would love to be part of the Grand Marais Area Tourist Association. Um, they have wanted to have somebody in that position, so we'll get all of those spots covered. She included the calendar so we could get everything on our own personal calendars as well. Um, so I just wanted to explain why that was added to our board packet. Madam, Madam Chair. Chair. Yes. Oh. Commissioner Storley. Um, were we supposed to get the calendar? It is attached to your agenda. Oh. Mm. It's the very last page. Sorry, I did not get that printed out. All right. No. We'll make sure you get that. Okay, that'd be great. All right. And Administrator Yorkie. Yes. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to say, and I know I'm, this runs the risk of coming off as shameless flattery, but I... I wanted to say, uh, Commissioner Mills, I'm glad to hear you say that you feel like a weight has lifted. <laughs> um, and I also wanted to thank you for your steady, thoughtful leadership of this board over the last year. It's been really great working with you as chair. Um, and I'm just really happy with this whole board. Um, we've got, you guys have a really great team. You've got really productive working relationships. And from my position as administrator, that's everything. You have a high-functioning board um, that works together well, that treats each other with respect. Um, that just makes my job so much easier. So um, Commissioner Mills, just wanted to thank you for your leadership again. Um, Madam Chair, I'm really happy to have you in the cha chair position too. I know you're going to do a great job. Um, and just thanks to all of you for, for the work that you're doing and the way that you're doing it. It really makes a difference. Thank you so much. I echo that, and, and I want to thank my co-pilot here <laughs> for uh, being able and available to step in at any moment. All right. Anything else for commissioner reports, meeting updates? We've talked a little bit about AMC and our tribal relations coming up in February. Um, we've talked about our correspondence and memos. And now we'd like to move on to recognition of staff. We have some anniversaries. We have Adriana Brisson in the auditor's office for one year. Leah Ekstrom in HR, but uh, with the county for a total of seven years now. Jamie Green in the sheriff's office, four years. Holly Schroeder, recorder's office, 23 years. Brian Silence in maintenance, 22 years. It's probably felt like 40, <laughs> given all that he's had to do. Nanette Silence in the Highway Department, 11 years. Brody Smith in the Recycling Center for four years. And April Zimmer, who keeps this group together and rolling. 
um, are in administration three years. And then we have some January milestones. Martina Johnson and PHHS, 15 years. Mitch Travis and Land Services, five years. And last but not least, Canine Eddie, who's been with <laughs> us for four years. Can we give Canine Eddie some dog treats? <laughs> I hope that's in the budget. <laughs> All right. Anything else for the good of the order? All right. If not, I'd take a motion to adjourn. So I'll move, Madam Chair. All right. And we don't. All right. We have support. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> All right. Motion carries. Have a good day. Community Center Board.